Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall, for The Spectator. Today I have the privilege of speaking with psychologist, best-selling author and most renowned intellectual in the world today, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Dr. Peterson, thank you so much for hey, taking my pleasure. Time. Well, uh, I can add to the list of your um, uh, many... Uh, um, sins. Sins. Uh, Stand-up comedian last mm. night at Comedy Unleashed in Hackney at the um, Backyard Comedy Club. You did your... Was it your first comedy set? Um, yes, uh, my first comedy set as perpetrator rather than victim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And did you enjoy it? It was fun, yeah. I read this little kid's book I wrote uh, called This Is Not A Hat. I read it for, wrote it for my two-year-old grandson and uh, it was a Dr. Seuss-like poem. And People, I had read it at a dinner meeting, weirdly enough, a while back, and people who were there encouraged me to read it as part of this comedy set. It's, I thought, it, well, I described it as white man's rap for two-year-olds, which is basically what it was. <laughs> so yeah, it was really fun, and the comedy set was great, uh, unbelievably funny. It was such a relief to go to a comedy venue that was funny. Huh. Remember when comedians used to be funny? <laughs> Some of them still are. Bill Burr's special on Netflix is oh, yeah, the new special is pretty good, man. Yeah. But you said last night that you're going to release two children's books. Is that is that is that poem going to be one of them? Well, I have. It's complicated because I'm releasing a book in October called An ABC of Childhood Tragedy, and it's for children. But it's not. It's really, really dark and gothic. But it's also, it's 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 it consists of these poems I wrote about how adults mistreat children. And there, I wrote it when I was doing a lot of clinical work and so was disturbed about what I was seeing. But they're also blackly comedic and so you, each of them is a four stanza poem about a particular pathway to devastation for children. But they're all, they also have a humorous twist in them. And then I had them illustrated by Yulia Fogra, who did my illustrations for my last book, Beyond Order, who's a really gifted illustrator, and she made these unbelievably beautiful and deep illustrations. And so it's this strange intermingling of the gothic, the humorous, and the beautiful, all, all arrayed together. And that's a, a strange nexus, a darkness and humor and beauty. And so the books sort of occupy that niche. There's two of them. We'll release one at a time. And we did a lot of, well, there's other uh, elements to the creative production, but that'll all be released starting at the end of October. I don't know what people think because the poems are very, very dark. And so they're definitely not for children. But I've also written some books that are genuinely for children, especially for very young children. And some of them were derived from poems verses that I wrote for my own kids when they were little, when I would play with them. And then I found a while back that I had a talent, I suppose, for writing verse. I wrote a, I wrote a screenplay uh, called The Water of Life, which is a, an adaptation of Grimm's Brother fairy tale. And that's been really fun. I've been recording some music for it. We have three of the songs, because well, as I said, it's a musical. We have three of the songs recorded in draft form already. And uh, I've been working with a bunch of musicians, which I just love. It's so fun. And I, I can hardly think of anything I would rather do than that. So what's it's really fun. Your, your There's an interest there in, in children's stories then. Yeah. What, what, where, where does that interest for you come from? What, why have you focused on a, a screenplay and two books and this, this poetry? It's clearly... Something. Well, you never know. If you're, if you're pursuing something creative, you actually don't know why. Not really. Because the creative pursuit is the discovery of why. In some, if you can say exactly why you're doing an artistic project, you're probably producing propaganda. Mm. Most of the time, if you're doing something creative, you discover why long after. Mm. And if it's a work of creative genius, it might take generations of people, hundreds of years, to discover why you were doing it. Mm. Because art really is on the forefront of cognitive transformation. I mean literally and practically. Art, especially imaginative art, but any true art, it's, it's not philosophy yet, right? But it's also not 
the unknown. It's right on the border. And our, that's where artists live, the open people by temperament. They live on the border between order and chaos. And they're farther out into the chaos, which is why they often have chaotic lives and often can't catalyze an identity, right? Because they're also one of the problems with being creative. And we're seeing that a lot of the people who have identity issues, let's say in the modern world, um, they may have their psychological problems, and, and that's generally uh, highly likely, but they also tend to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And the downside of creativity is that it's very difficult to catalyze identity, because you're mutable if you're creative. Because you're not, by definition, if you're creative, you're not the same thing from moment to moment. And you see this in this insistence about the mutability of identity. Well, you know, you can be one gender one minute and another the next. It's like, well, yes, in some sense. What, it, what the hell do you expect the people around you to do, right? To keep up with your mutable transformations? Like, good luck. That's actually interesting if there's, if there's a correlation then between creatives and people who hold this progressive... Uh, oh, definitely. It's a huge predictor. Of, well, openness, which is the creativity dimension, is the best predictor of liberal political belief. What, it's what, far the best predictor. From a psychological point, point of view, why, well, it strikes me that the film and music are very pro-establishment at the moment and hyper-progressive. Comedy seems to be not so much. Mm -hmm. But from a psychological point of view, what, why is that? Is it, is, is it simply that uh, the personality traits line up? Or is it possible that, there's a, that these uh, groups of people, communities, can ossify in their, in their uh, thinking? Well, the, 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 it's, it's very complicated. I would say that the political proclivity of the artistic temperament at the moment is manifesting itself in a way that runs counter to the essence of the artistic temperament. And so if you're on the artistic side, let's say, you might be more willing to speak for what hasn't been included and what's diverse, right? But when you make that into a mantra and then you impose that requirement on your own art, well, <laughs> then you're sawing off the branch that you sit on. Mm. Because the one thing that artists have, it's the only thing they have, is creative freedom. Mm. And that's a very expensive thing to have because the probability that you're going to be successful as a creative artist is virtually zero. Mm. Now, if you are successful, you can be hyper successful, mm. but it's a high stakes, it's a high risk, high return game. It probably won't work, but if it does work, it works better than anything else, but it'll only work if you can't put a priori demands on the manifestation of the creative spirit. Not, not, not in some arbitrary political sense. You can't subordinate, look, you can't subordinate what's highest to what's, what's lower. You cannot subordinate the divine to the political, not without getting yourself. <laughs> Not without getting yourself in a lot of trouble. And if you have a divine spark, let's say, that's a creative spark, and you subordinate it to the political, first of all, there is no bigger sin than you could, that you could commit. Mm. It's, a, it's really a bad idea. It's a bad idea psychologically. Because the thing about creative people, I had lots of them as clients. Lots of my clients weren't creative, by the way. But lots of them were. And I had to treat them quite differently. Uh, creative people cannot live without being creative. That's the wellspring of their psychic energy, so to speak, psychological energy. Mm. I don't mean, you know, uh, necromancy and, mm. and divination psychic. And so it's just like an extroverted person withers unless they can be around other pr people. Mm. You know? And an agreeable person withers unless they have someone to take care of. And a conscientious person withers unless they have some duty to, to uphold. Mm -hmm. uh, a creative person withers unless they're doing something creative, and if they subordinate that to the merely political, then they, they're, they're tearing out their own heart. And certainly that's happening on the... And then there's... there's the doing thing. it without realizing they're doing it. So uh, take, for example, uh, the film director Olivia Wilde calling you a uh, pseudo-intellectual and, and, and villa using you as the uh, model God for the, of the villain. Incels. Yeah. King of the That's a funny but, king, uh, a king of the incels. <laughs> That's a very strange sort of king. But it, it, it's the epitome of, of a lack of uh, intellectual curiosity. And you'd think that, that people in the creative industry would want to explore things instead of 
I don't think she even realises probably that she's bl- being political there. She, she, it's second nature to her almost. Well, and required. Think. Well, that, well, that's the darker side of this. So, uh, you know, I outlined the positive side in some sense, but the darker side is, if you're, there isn't anything that's more. There isn't anything higher than genuine creative endeavor. Mm-hmm. And it should be properly put on a pedestal and generally is in some sense. But it, it opens up a, a domain of temptation. And the temptation is to let your political belief, so just your belief mm-hmm. in, this, in, in some sense, and it's not even yours, because almost all people have political beliefs that many other people share. And so they're not their beliefs. Mm. So Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. And that's right. And so you think those ideas are yours. It's like, no, they're not. It's 20 million people, 200 million people have the same ideas. How are they yours? You, did you create these ideas? Highly unlikely. You very rarely meet someone who comes up with a novel political idea, especially on any ideological front. And so it's easy to adopt an ideology and it's very satisfying because it explains everything without any effort. And then it's even, then there's another temptation which is, well, I'll take my ideology and I will put it in a position that superordinates the artist. I mean, what a deal that is. And so then you can show how you're morally superior to Shakespeare. It's like, really? You're morally superior to Shakespeare, are you? That's your claim. Well, you know, he's a dead white man. It's like, oh, I see. So you've got, you've got that all over him, do you? And that's, your, that's actually what you're claiming. You're actually claiming that what you believe makes you morally superior to Shakespeare. And that doesn't have a little whiff of narcissism about it. So, you know, you go into art galleries now. I, I, it's very hard for me to go into art galleries often now because you'll see something that's so spectacularly great that you could look at it for like a year. And, and in some sense, people do, right? Because they worship these pieces of art. They celebrate them. And then you'll see some, the comment by an art critic and they'll talk about the moral failings of the artist regardless of their time and place. And it's, it's basically what it is is the art critic is trumpeting themselves as morally superior to whoever made this amazing thing that's worth like a billion dollars. And not only that, but offering the viewer the temptation to do the same. It's like, oh, this is great. I could never do that. I'm quite minimal in relationship to this remarkable talent. Oh, but I have the correct political opinions. Thus, I'm a better person. It's like, oh my God, that's so... It's so narcissistic, it's so toxic, it and it's, it's the death of art. art. It's the death of art. Like the, art like this will just won't last a generation. You no. get, you c- no. you can't well, you know, and that's the other thing in the artistic world, is that the artistic world is always cluttered up by propagandistic ideology, and what time does is winnow that all out. And so I like going to modern art museums. Uh, I would probably generally prefer a modern art museum to a classic art museum, although I like both, because I sometimes you see some modern art is so good that it's just beyond belief, but most of it's just junk. But that's okay because the junk gets winnowed out, you know. And but it's the same. I think it was Robert Heinlein, the I think it was Heinlein, who said that ninety-five percent of everything is bullshit, and and that's not pessimistic, you know. There is this replication crisis, so-called, in the social sciences that that's been trumpeted much in the last ten years and. People have been falling all over themselves to make science much worse in an attempt to cure the replication crisis. What is replication? Well, it meant that a lot of the classic studies that were done in disciplines, particularly like social psychology, but many social sciences disciplines, didn't replicate, didn't repeat when other people tried to repeat them. So they were published in high status journals and they got a lot of press and attention short term, like over maybe a 10 year period, not a 100 year period, but a 10 year period. And then there was a number of investigators who then started to do what you're supposed to do in science, which is replicate studies. Um, And then often these studies didn't replicate the classic studies, 50% of the time, something like that. And everyone was shocked. It was like, oh my God, 
All these things we took for granted. It's like, well, first of all, if you were really a good scientist, you didn't take them for granted to begin with because they were 10 years old. So that's not very time tested. And, and second, if you have, have a, any sense, you think if 5% of the things we publish in scientific journals are true and new, we're advancing at a rate that's so spectacular that we can already barely keep up. And you think, like, what do you think? 95% of published science is correct? You have to be daft to think that. It's really hard to establish a new truth. I mean, think about how revolutionary that is to do that. And so, so 95% of science is not good. And 95% of restaurants are subpar. And like, this is the way of the world. And we also don't know how much subpar activity is necessary to generate anything of value. It might be 95% of it. Well, think about it on the scientific front. Well, a lot of studies are published in lower tier journals. So there's thousands of journals. And so there's a hierarchy of quality. And the worst studies on average would be published in the worst journals, but not always. Sometimes a really stellar piece of research that no one likes, which is how you can tell it's true, gets published in a low tier journal because it's so shocking that no one will abide by it. So you need the variation, but you need the lower tier journals because, well, if you're a beginning scientist and you're not very good at it, you still have to publish. So you have to publish somewhere that's not that good. And so, and, and science is a very difficult enterprise, just like any creative endeavor is difficult and, and getting to the heart of the matter, man, that's, you're lucky if you do that once or twice in your career. So, and it's the same on the artistic front, you know, most of it's, I think that's maybe particularly true in the visual arts, but, but maybe not. Most of it's subpar, and, and, but that's okay. On creating something new, mm -hmm. there's something quite moving in Maps of Meaning. At the end of the book, you publish a letter or, that mm. you've written to your father, mm. and there's a line in it, and I, I forget the exact line, but mm. it's something like, I, I'm struggling to articulate this, but I really think I've come across an idea that hasn't been thought of before, that is new. Mm. And so, to what extent is your work new? The, um, that, that, that's a good question. Um, in, in some sense, it's not new at all. At all. You know, it, it partakes of a pattern, but the articulation is new. But it's that's also it's also not it's not also not unique to me. So Maps of Meaning, that book, it's the same book as Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's the same book There's as Jung's book. yeah. It's the same book as Jung's Symbols of Transformation, and it's the same book as Eric Neumann's Origins and History of Consciousness. When you say it's the same, you mean you don't think you pushed the needle? Oh yeah, they're they're variants, you know, but they're variants of a central narrative. And, and there are variants of the central narrative. That's another way of thinking about it. And Campbell did a really good job on the popularization front. Mm -hmm. you know, and Jung sketched this out more deeply than anyone else and first. And he, it was symbols of transformation that broke his relationship with Freud. It was because Jung touched on the religious in symbols of transformation. And Freud was uh, an enlightenment figure. And a, a counter-religious enlightenment figure. And so when Jung touched on the religious, Freud believed that he was engaged in an activity that was antithetical to the Freudian enterprise, which was something like the, it was an insistence on, on secularization. And so they broke apart on that issue. Um, and, and Freud, I wouldn't say Freud was wrong because Freud was a genius. I mean, Freud was the person who put the finger on the Oedipal issue, which is like, that's the central issue of our time. The devouring mother. It's like, yeah, she's back. That's for sure. And he was the first person who really, he really put his finger on that from a clinical perspective, like so consciously and explicitly. There'd been mythologies of the devouring mother forever. Mm -hmm. Stories, you know, of the witch that lived in the forest, Hansel and Gretel. It's a perfect story for the modern time, right? Because there are children who are lost. Well, hey, that's for sure. And what do they come across? Well, they come across a house made of gingerbread. Like, you know what? That's a bit too good to be true. 
Right. And so there's a witch inside. And what does she want to do? Well, offer the children everything they want. Why? So she can eat them. Yeah, that's for sure. And Freud, he put his finger on that in a, in a stunningly brilliant manner. And, and still a very deeply misunderstood manner. Now, the Jungians elaborated on that vision tremendously. Eric Neumann, who wrote this book, The Origins and History of Consciousness, also wrote a book called The Great Mother, which is a compendium of the symbolism of the feminine. It's a brilliant book. I talked to Camille Pellia about Eric Neumann. She knew of him independently, which is quite rare among um, modern academic intellectuals. I've read that book, the... Yeah. the, the uh origins of consciousness oh yeah it's, it's a, yeah uh, amazing it's, it's a great book he was a student of Jung. Right? he was yes and and when Jung wrote the foreword to origins in the history of consciousness he said that was the book he had been struggling to write and neumann was able to integrate Jung wrote i don't know 30 books dense difficult books mm. Jung's a very difficult thinker and neumann was able to synthesize that and both in the origins in the history of consciousness and the great mother and you know, Kemi Opelia said to me, and this is a conclusion she'd reached completely on her own, and it was amazing to me because it was it paralleled the conclusion I had reached, um, for what that's worth, that if the literary critics had turned to Neumann and Jung instead of Foucault and Derrida, the whole culture war would have the whole the whole situation pertaining to the culture war would have been entirely different. Because, so? Well, because the, the postmodernists got something right. They figured out in some real sense that the problem of perception was intractable. So imagine there's a multitude of interpretations for any given text. You have students read Macbeth and they write 30 students write 30 essays, they all have different opinions. It's like, okay, well, if they all have different opinions, what's the core meaning of the text? And the answer is, we don't know. Well, how do we come to a determination of what the meaning is? We don't know. Well, could we come to a determination of the meaning of the text? Well, the text is very complicated and it's sub subject to an infinite variety of views. So it doesn't look like it's possible to come to a determination of the meaning of the text. Well, then how do we decide which set of texts is canonical? We don't know. Maybe we do it by exercising power. It's like diagnosis, correct. Solution, wrong. And that was that unholy marriage between postmodernism and Marxism. And there were other reasons for it, but that it was this pathological leap from problem, and it's a big problem, the problem of perception. It's no wonder the literary critics stumbled over it. But the idea that we solve the problem of perception by exercising power, if you define power as compulsion, let's say, I can make you do what I want. And that's what we're doing as human beings, is we're competing to see who gets to make other people do what we want. And that's the basis not only for social organization, which is the Marxist claim, but for perception itself, which is certainly a claim that's put forth by the people who uh, promote the implicit association test, for example, which purports to diagnose um, your implicit bias and the manner in which power structures your, say, racial perceptions. It's like, and there's a huge difference between the claim that power corrupts your perceptions and your interactions and, and that you have to be alert to that, and the claim that no, it's the basis of perception itself. There isn't a more, there is not a more cynical and nihilistic and corrosive claim than the claim that power structures your perceptions. The world is instantly at war if that claim is promoted, because it means that you're here for what you can get from me now, and I'm here talking to you for purely instrumental reasons, and the only reason we get along at all even in principle, is because our power claims align, and as soon as they don't, there's nothing between us but enmity and struggle. And that is definitely, that's the Marxist worldview in a nutshell. And it is something dark. And you can tell, you know, 100 million corpses have been stacked up 
in a hundred years just to show you how dark that is. And then it's masked by this claim. Well, we're for the poor. It's like, really? First of all, that's not that easy. Because poverty is certainly not caused by something as simple as a lack of money. Poverty is very complicated. And if you want to do something about it, well, good luck to you. It's very, very difficult. It's easy to hand wave and say, well, I stand for the oppressed. It's like, yes, well, you maintain your position and privilege. Now you're also standing for the oppressed. So not only are you perpetrator, but you're victim. And that's a bit too much for anyone to claim simultaneously. It's one of the things that always bothered me about what has been allowed to happen in the Ivy League school. It's like, well, we're for the oppressed. It's like, you're already part of the power structure that you hypothetically oppose. As soon as you cross the threshold into Princeton or Yale, I don't care where you came from, you're now in the 1%. Now, you might be a baby 1%er. You're probably more like a one one hundredth of one percenter, or maybe a one one thousandth of one percenter. So, and that's not good enough for you, right? Being having that status and that privilege, that's not good enough. You need to also accrue all the moral virtue that should rightly be reserved for the truly oppressed. You have to have both, because just being privileged isn't enough. You have to be privileged and underprivileged at the same time, and then that's all facilitated by the panderers to this juvenile narcissism that the universities have have become it's appalling do you think there's any hope for the universities hopefully you know and i think there are still people who are struggling to do a credible job and i think there are still some credible institutions but but they made i've watched large Remember 2008, too big to fail? Remember that? No. Oh, well, that was the mantra when, when the politicians were colluding with the business types to socialize their risk. It's like, well, we can't let AIG fail. It's too big because systemic disruption, too big to fail. It's like, that was completely, it was an anti-truth. It wasn't just a lie. It's like, because the truth is so big, you will certainly fail. And so I've watched large organizations collapse and I have some sense of how it happens. What happens first of all is they start to shake. And then the small minority of people who are doing all the productive work, if you have 10,000 employees, 100 of them do half the work. Right? That's not very many. Now let's say you have 10,000 employees and your corporation has a couple of bad quarters, maybe because of bad management decisions, maybe you got a narcissist at the helm. Well, the hundred people who are awake and on their feet, they think, uh oh, I can't do my job anymore. Well, it's not like they don't have options. I mean, everyone knows who these people are, not just inside the company, but outside. They just leave. It's like the top hundred people leave. You've lost 50% of your productivity. And well, then the next people who leave are the next 25% of the productivity. Then you're just left with, after that happens in two or three cycles, you're just left with people who not only can't do anything, but who think their job is to get in the way. And you're just done. And companies, huge companies, can collapse unbelievably precipitously, and that happens all the time. You know, I think the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 com company is three, 30 years. And the average lifespan of a family fortune is three generations. And so there's lots of churn in the upper 1%. Like, the fact that there's a 1% is very stable. But the people who occupy that position churn, churn to a large degree. Not entirely, but to a, to a large degree. Anyways, large organizations can collapse precipitously, and they don't have to make much of a mistake to do that. The universities have made at least, they've made a series of fatal mistakes. So they've corporatized their endeavor, so now the students are consumers rather than students. And so they pandered to the worst of their consumer impulses. They, the faculty retreated and left all the authority in the hands of the administrators. The administrators then retreated and left all the authority in the hands of the DIE activists. So that's comical as hell to watch in a tragic and horrible way. Um, they've devalued the currency because standards have decreased. Uh, they're, 
their, their quality of education, generally speaking, is unbelievably low. Their dropout rate, on average, in higher education institutions is 50%. At Hillsdale, which is a conservative institution, it's 1%. That's a big difference, 50% versus 1%. And 50% is utterly inexcusable. Uh, it's a waste of time and money, but it doesn't matter because the institutions can still accrue the money of the people who fail. Mm. And they don't care. Uh, so, so, um, it seems like with the Peterson Fellowship that you've launched and your work with Ralston College that mm. you're not so hopeful to change the institutions from within, but to do so from... The outside to build. Well, I think one of the ways you change institutions is by setting up alternatives to compete with them. And so one of the things we're starting this Peterson Academy, um, which isn't a name I'm particularly thrilled about, but it has its marketing advantages, let's say, and marketing is communication. And so you don't want to be cynical about communication because if you're doing something and no one knows about it, that's not that helpful to your enterprise. In any case, we have a good array of professors, a great array of professors who are making eight-hour courses for us and we're hoping to establish accreditation and I want to drive the cost of a bachelor's degree down to four thousand dollars. One fortieth the current cost and I think that's, I think that can be done mm -hmm. and one fortieth is a lot cheaper mm -hmm. and I think that we can offer, now it's hard to replace a university with, with an online enterprise because we don't know what universities do. And it's easy to think that what they do is provide facts and examinations, right? So lectures and accreditation, but ex lectures, exams, and accreditation. But that's probably 5% of what universities truly do. And the rest of it we don't really understand. So they provide a, an intermediary between adolescence and adulthood for creative and intelligent people, right? They provide those same people with an identity that socially uh, valued student while they're sorting out the complexities of their destiny. They move young people from what might be a counterproductive group of peers that's arbitrarily assigned, let's say by the public school system, to a group that is more appropriate to their talents and their abilities. They provide a mediating place for people who are immature to start to adopt the responsibilities of independent adulthood. They're a place where people can eat together. They're a place where people can drink together and have fun so they together. They need to be together. Well, there's, you know, there's, there's all these things that universities are doing that is very difficult to duplicate online. And so we're trying to wrestle with that complexity. But on the provision of lectures and exams and accreditation front, I think we can give them a run for their money mm -hmm. uh, and also at a very high level of quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're trying to gather people who love to teach and then leave them alone. It's like, so there's no strictures in some sense in our enterprise. It's like I'm trying to find people who I think are really, really smart and then inviting them to teach what they want to teach the best way they can. And so we'll see how that goes. And then with Ralston College in Savannah, that's a more, that's a more traditional university. So it has buildings, and and we run our first. We're in the midst of running our first master's program while you and I were just in Greece. To to how how was that? I mean, uh, unbelievable, really. These yeah. students were doing four hours of ancient Greek in the morning, four hours of modern Greek in the afternoon, and this was first of four terms of a master's degree. All the while doing day trips to Patmos to see. Uh, where John had his revelation to Ephesus to see where St. John came, you know, up to preach the Logos, the, the logos mm -hmm. exactly. Um, so, I mean, as, as far as a university course go, comes, like, it's hard to imagine one beating that. Yeah. Really. yeah, well, and literally, like, it's literally hard to imagine because we were both there watching. We yeah. thought, well, it, I can't, and that's a lovely place to be. You know you're in a good place when you literally can't imagine it being any better, mm -hmm. not in any real sense. And so yeah, that was certainly the experience in Greece, that's for sure, and in Turkey. And uh, there, there's, um, so just to rewind one, one moment, you, you, you've criticized the 
postmodernists, and you, you, you do it often. And, um, yeah. uh, for, but also gave the devil his due. You know, the sure. postmodernists were definitely onto something. They, they also knew that we see the world through a story. Mm-hmm. That's, they just got the story wrong. Just. just. <laughs> but, 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 they, but it's really something to, to have noticed. And, and the French intellectuals like, like Foucault, who is brilliant, although twisted, and bent in a terrible way, but brilliant. I mean, Foucault was one of the first people to really put his finger on this, and and his his book, uh, uh, The Order of Things. The first half of that book is brilliant. It, it deteriorates as it goes. He, it needed to be edited more near the end. What well, did you find so brilliant about it? His grappling with the notion of the structure of our conceptual structures. Right. He knew that we we saw the world through a structure, and he had an intimation that it was narrative in nature, and he lays that out by analyzing older structures of knowledge uh, in a sense from the perspective of an anthropologist or a psychologist. He does very much what Jung did with his work on alchemy. It's very similar except Jung derived almost completely opposite conclusions to Foucault. And Foucault, Foucault had his problems, let's put it that way, and they definitely tilted his thinking in a counterproductive direction. You're referring to his sexual deviance, or? Yes, and not only, it, it isn't only that. It, so he was, he was gay, and, but That's that, not what I was referring to as a yeah, sexual deviance, yeah, by the yeah, way. I know, I know, good work, that'll make you popular. <laughs> Deviant does mean different from the norm. Right. You know, so, so um, technically that's true. Devi- to devi- it means to deviate from the path in some sense, right? But I mean, Foucault, was also a little bit more interested in, let's say, young people than, mm-hmm. you know, he might have been. Which is what I was referring yeah. to. Yes, and, and, and in a manner that appears to be quite deeply pathological in, in, in a very, 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 very dark way. And, well, we won't say much more about that. that. I mean, in the, early in this conversation, we talked about artists not being political or, or not letting uh, what the artist's opinion doesn't really matter on the art itself, the art just Even that. But does that not apply with Foucault to an extent where what he did in his private life, uh, well, it does horrid to an as, it, as it was? Oh, definitely. Well, that's why you actually, hopefully, you know. It's, it's why? Because to live people. it is to, right, his actions actually speak more for his philosophy than his words. Well, no, at least his actions, his philosophy, there's a relation between his philosophy and his actions. Now, what the relation is, that's a very difficult thing to sort out. And you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, when we look at people, historical figures, and this is happening all the time, we look at someone great, Francis Galton would be a good example because he's been the target of progressive attacks for his hypothetical doctrines of racial superiority, which fundamentally means that people who are attacking Galton just never read him, and no one does although my student Daniel Higgins uh, wrote a thesis about Galton and did read him and Galton was a very, Galton was an amazing person, he was a polymath, he was an utter genius, he made signal contributions to like a hundred disciplines, he was really something, but he was also a man of his time and place and a lot of intellectual scholarship now consists of going back over someone's biography with a fine tooth comb finding some way they were in keeping with their times that doesn't match modern sensibility, and then saying, well, I don't have to read anything that person wrote. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, fair enough in some sense, but people do this with Freud all the time too, because Freud was a Victorian, for better or worse, and not everything he said jives with modern sensibility. It's like, well, you don't have to read Freud, but then you don't get to read Freud. And... Freud is 90% wheat and 10% chaff, and 10% is still quite a lot, but 90% wheat is pretty good. The typical book is 1% wheat and 99% chaff. You know, I often read books where there's, there's not a single idea in the book, really. You know, it's, 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 it's a shallow rehash of ideas that were well established in multiple ways uh, by many people. Well, the, and, but the, Freud's not like that. The interpretation of dreams is there's something brilliant on every page, and man, you can learn that, you know. And and maybe and same with Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche said some bitter things about women, for example. And so you can take those and you can say, well, who's going to listen to him? It's like, 
fair enough, you know, don't. But it's Nietzsche. So that's your loss, man, not his. He's dead. He doesn't care. But but the idea that and it's the same with Foucault, you know. I mean, I'm not a fan of Foucault's private life. That's for sure. And I have some sense of a clinician of just how dark it was. And it was plenty dark. And did that affect his philosophy? Yes. I think it made him much more attracted by Marxist doctrines of power than he would have otherwise been. And some of that was definitely self-serving, as far as I can tell. But The Order of Things is a great book. So you read and you differentiate and you discriminate just like you do when you're talking to someone and you try to separate the wheat from the chaff and gather the wheat and let the chaff fly away. And that's, that's what we do as we move forward historically and winnow through the past. And, and you don't say, because it's adulterated, you don't say it's all chaff. You know, no, that's a bad idea. And that universities, were, that's what they were there to teach people to do. Is to, what does it mean to read critically? It doesn't mean, first of all, criticize doesn't mean, here's why you're wrong, I dispense with you. It doesn't mean harsh attack. Criticize means analyze, take what's good, gather it, leave the rest. That's what, that's what critical thinking means. It doesn't mean win the argument. No, it, means, it means this unbelievably fine balance between judgment and between rejection and acceptance, between judgment and mercy. And that's the Logos. That's what the Logos does. That's why Christ as Logos is the final judge. That's why Christ as Logos in the Apocalypse damns and saves. It's, it's the archetypal representation of the action of the Logos. It really is. And it's doing that all the time. And so, and that's happening to us all the time. Both psychologically and, and sociologically. That's why the, the book of Revelation was appended to the Bible. Which is so strange because it's such a it's such a strange book, right? It's a hallucinogenic vision. Hmm. It, it, it's so it's strange. It's so different too. from J the John's Gospel. Oh yeah. John's Gospel is considered one of the, if not the greatest works of ancient Greek writing. Mm -hmm. It's perfect, and then the Revelation, unfinished sentences. Mm -hmm. It's all over the place. By it's sort of it's like, almost like this. I mean, there's even debate that it's a different author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in some ways, in some ways, it is because. The revelation is the visionary imagination, and 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 the Gospel of John is is articulated philosophy. I mean, there's still a theological element to it, obviously, but but it, but it's not much different than the relationship between "Thus Spake Zarathustra" and the rest of Nietzsche's writings. "Thus Spake Zarathustra" is a visionary account, mm -hmm. and it's if you didn't know that the same people wrote. Beyond good and evil, and thus they speak Zarathustra. You, it would be very difficult to figure it out because the, even the language is, is different. And thus speak Zarathustra, is, it's not unpacked. It's, it hasn't been unpacked. It's still a dream. Jung, ran a seminar on thus speak Zarathustra. I believe the seminar notes are eighteen hundred pages long, and he got through the first third. And so. In a vision, there's, there's tremendous information packed into a genuine vision, I, almost inexhaustible. I, I'll give you an example, if I can. It's a lot to unpack. So, when God chases Adam and Eve out of paradise, he sets up cherubim with flaming swords to bar the way back to paradise. And that's a very strange image. And and you should see it as a strange image. I mean, you can imagine it painted as an image, and many people have attempted to represent that image in, in pictorial form. It's a very strange image, and it's, it's either insane in some sense, whatever that means, because a lot of insanity is visionary too, or you just don't understand it at all. And that's a better initial presumption. It's like, you just don't understand this at all. Well, I can tell you some of the things it means. It's unbelievable that this can be the case. So the cherubim, cherubim are the monsters that exist in some sense at the base of any conceptual structure. And so as every concept has an ideal at its center and a fringe, 
And it has to have a fringe because it runs into other concepts. And where it runs into other concepts, there's ambiguity. And you can see that playing out in the debate about gender. It's like there are lots of masculine women and feminine men. And so th there's a category of masculine, male, and a category of female, but there's a fringe. And at the fringe, there are chimeras. A monster is a chimera. And a chimera is an intermingling of different categories. And there are monsters at the fringe. And that's a cherubim. Mm -hmm. And it, it supports an ideal. And it's like the gargoyles on the outside of cathedrals. It's the same kind of idea. And, and it's the idea of the margin and the fringe. And, and that's the place where unity becomes multiplicity. And part of the demand of the postmodernists was that the multiplicity take the center. But it can't. By definition, the center has to be occupied by a unity. That's what makes it a center. But in any case, back to the, the cherubim. Now they hold swords that turn every which way, and they are on fire, and they bar the gates to paradise. Well, why? Because it's something like, imagine that in paradise only what's best exists. Well, that's sort of like the definition of paradise. Okay, then imagine that everything about you that isn't worthy of being in paradise has to go. And then imagine that that's cut away with the flaming sword. And that's what that means. And then there's more to it than that. So, the flaming sword is... It's the separation of the wheat from the chaff. And the whole Christian narrative is embedded in that image. That that which purifies you will also be that which destroys you hellishly. And you see that tangled up in the passion story, because the passion story is not only encounter with tragedy in the most fundamental sense, and I mean that technically, mm -hmm. because the passion is an archetypal tragedy. It can't VR. be, it's, yeah, well, it, in some real sense, it's the distillation of tragedy. I'm speaking psychologically. But it, that's not enough, because, so imagine that you will have to face the worst things that could happen to you. Well, you, you are going to have to face that, so that's going to happen. But then imagine that's not enough. Not only do you have to face, in order to cope, in order to become who you are even, you have to face the worst things that are going to happen to you, but you also have to be willing to do that, and optimally, voluntarily willing to do that, and maybe even embrace it. But that's not enough, you know, because the passion, which is a story of torture and innocence, that's not enough. The mythology that surrounds the passion also insists that Christ harrowed hell, right? So death and catastrophe wasn't enough. It had to be hell itself. And you might ask, well, what's hell? And they, you wouldn't ask that question if you'd ever been there. But hell is... Well, hell is Auschwitz, you know, hell is the Gulag Archipelago, hell is the consequence of tyranny, hell is the spirit that drives the atrocity of history. And maybe you have to face that too. And maybe in facing that, that's the swords that turn and burn. And maybe that burns everything away. And that's all embedded in that image. Right at the beginning of this, that story. And so, a revelation can be so profound that it takes almost forever to unpack. And so, and Jung, for example, moved the process of unpacking that forward, and so did Joseph Campbell, and so did Eric Neumann. And I think, I hope that I did some of that more in Maps of Meaning, and that that's partly what I'm doing in my public work, is unpacking this. And so, you asked me originally, way back when we got into this, about the originality of my ideas, and it's like, well, they're not original in some sense, because they're they're based on something that's, that manifests itself as an unbelievably deep pattern. But the pattern becomes more explicit as it unfolds. And, and, and that's part of the problem, part of the process of becoming conscious itself. Is the process of conscious, of becoming conscious, is the process of the implicit becoming conscious. That's like a becoming realized. In experience, it's almost like a definition of consciousness. And it might be a definition of being, which is 
being is something like the manifestation into actuality of the implicit. And that's what we participate in as conscious beings. And so, and you do that as an artist, you're, you're on the forefront of that. And you don't subordinate that to what comes later, right? You don't subordinate the art to the explanation. The explanation emerges from the art, if it's a genuine explanation. And that's why we turn to artists, to even teach us to see. Now, every modern person sees the world through the eyes of a French Impressionist. We see beauty the same place as they saw it. Mm -hmm. And they taught us how to do that. And literally, and now we see with their eyes. And thank God for artists, because they, they enable us to see with the eyes of a visionary. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. so, and you don't subordinate that to the political. God, that's a, that's a catastrophic sin. And we're doing that like mad now. I remember when reading Maps of Meaning, and, and I, I was in the studio at the time uh, making uh, a Mumford & Sons record uh, called Delta, and what you're saying, well, I really got this from the book, it's not just a responsibility for artists, uh, well rather um, I felt like I wasn't pushing myself into the chaos enough within myself, like looking deep. deep well, you within. certainly solved that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite. Well, actually, on, the, on that side of things, and, and maybe this ties in with revelation, I felt when I've been, when in my, by comparison with what you've gone through, a very small version of getting entangled in the, the, the wars of, of culture and all this stuff, that does feel like a spiritual onslaught, and mm. it almost feels like revelation and, and the battle of angels and demons and, mm. and, um, and I certainly remember f for my mum, for her it was very painful seeing mm. me go through those right. things and she's even more I think spiritual than I am and, and I wondered whether you felt that way at all with you know you have press and all sorts of lies written about you regularly and does it feel well, like a spiritual uh, battle for you? Yeah but that's probably it that's probably in some ways what would I say, not new in some sense. It's new in that it had been practically manifesting itself in the world, but that was a conceptual world I already inhabited, I would say back as early as 1985, when I started working on the, the ideas that became Maps of Meaning. Mm -hmm. and I, I realized that this was a psychological problem, fundamentally, and uh, partly because of the influence of people like Jung and Solzhenitsyn, I think, and Orwell. Um, Nietzsche, they'd already put their finger in some real sense on the problem. Um, and so, but then to see it made manifest as fate, let's say, out in the world, well, that was, that was a whole different issue. But did, it, I mean, it became, what happened around me became absurdly and surreally dramatic in a, in a literary sense, I mean, that one of the things that shocked me most, I would say, just I just about fainted when I saw it, was to be cast by Ted Nahisi Coates as Red Skull in a Captain America car comic. That was really striking to me because I'm very interested in archetypal stories. I've watched all the Marvel movies and, of course, all the Harry Potter movies. I'm very interested in popular culture, and the Marvel universe, which is a theological universe, obviously like obviously, as is the Harry Potter universe, um, has a huge, it's a huge, hugely influential cultural force and quite countercultural. The, the Marvel world is very non-politically correct. Mm. It's quite remarkable. Well, and so is, 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 so is uh, J.K. Rowling's world, mm -hmm. um, but not for political reasons, either of them, which is why they've been so spectacularly successful. But Captain America is a, you know, a central archetypal trope, and to be cast as Red Skull was just, it was just beyond belief. When I first saw the comic, I thought that it was Photoshop, and then to find out that it wasn't, and then to find out that Don Easy Coates wrote it, it was like, what the hell is going on here? It was so over the top to not only be cast as a Nazi, but to be cast as, like, literally the magical Satan-like source of Nazism itself. It was, it was so over the top. And it was very difficult. I was very sick when it was happening too. Like, I would have much rather have been dead than to be as sick as I was. And to have that happen on top of that was just, it was just too much. 
And uh, it took a, us a couple of weeks, my family, to figure out how to parry that thrust, let's say, and which we we're quite happy with. We, we, this Czech kid sent me a, an illustration. So the, the, uh, the Hydra organization has a logo, which is, I believe it's a spider, um, and it's black on red. The two most primary colors, black, red, and white, are the fundamental primary colors um, of human perception. So black and red. And uh, he turned it into a lobster and did a very lovely job. And we thought that was very funny, and he sent it to us. And so then we thought, oh, well, we could, we could make lobster hydra merchandise and sell it for charity. That'd be funny. <laughs> it was funny, and so we made this symbol with this lobster hydra in the middle. And it uh, said, we put the words, tell the truth and clean up your room around it, and then we sold t-shirts and all sorts of things. And we raised like half a million dollars for charity, which was, that was good. That worked real well, because it, it was a bit humorous, you know? It's hard to be hu to have a sense of humor in a situation like that. But it's the only way out. Why well, it? it's it's the optimal way forward if you can do it and to play a bit with it, mm -hmm. you know. But it's very hard to play with accusations of satanic possession, <laughs> public accusations of satanic possession. But it was a relief in some sense, I would say, because, like, well, that's that's the limit of reputational assault. It's like where do you go from there? There's no place past that, so that was, in some sense, that was the end of that for me. Because at any assault that's subsequent to that, just like the Olivia Wilde thing, we, we, we thought that was amusing pretty much right away. Mm. And I don't think I would have thought that at all four years ago. Well, you know what this is like. I've met 150 people who have been publicly mobbed, almost all of them. It's very unsettling to people. It's, it's really the equivalent of a very, very serious illness. It's really hard on people. And I've seen extremely stable people, admirable people, well put together, just brought to the lowest extreme by that public shaming. It's an unbelievably vicious weapon. And we've enabled it uh, with our social media networks in a manner that we may pay a very big price for. Mm. I, I've well, you. you've, you've, you've been uh, through No, I, 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 and, and for me it was, uh, as well as everything else, I'd lost a ton of weight and uh, I wasn't sleeping for months and it was to it's totally hellish and I've interviewed a bunch of people in, on this podcast series about this and no, it's not enjoyable for anyone, it's, ho it's absolutely... Oh no, even, horrible. even, well you said what happened to you was relatively minimal and it wasn't because, you know, you're a pretty public figure and it was pretty public and it cost you a lot and so you went through, you went through it pretty hard. I've seen people who've gone through it, you know, sort of at their level of social prominence. You know, professors who've been attacked by student newspapers and their colleagues, let's say, which, which isn't happening on the same public scale as, as what happened to you. Um, but they, they respond to it. Well, look, people have two categories of fear, really. Fear of nature, which is death and insanity, like, you know, your own body betraying you and and an age all of that the ravages of nature but the second category of fear is social alienation and then those things are tangled up because historically if you were shunned <laughs> you were also dead mm. right because as soon as that social protection is stripped against you as, away from you especially if it's also turned against you mm. you don't have a hope mm. and so people this is partly why people are conformist and that's not all cowardice. A lot of it's, well, generally you should go along with the, it. Yeah, there's a lot. I, I sympathize. I got so many messages about people self-censoring when, when I went through my stuff. And, and actually, it's, it's not, they have families. They yeah. have these structures. Oh, yeah. Those aren't nothing. Oh, it's, definitely. It's, and they are worth, and I actually admire a lot of people who decide, actually, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice saying my piece here because I'm going to put my family first or I'm going yeah, to put my right. career, and, and there's there's great dignity and honor, yeah, honor well, in doing that the, I think the worst, but that, the problem with that is so it means that these ideas that become taboo then sort of win because yeah yeah well the worst conflicts are moral conflicts like real conflicts of duty so you might say well you have a responsibility to 
keep a civil tongue in your head, so to speak, to, to speak the truth, but then if you're in a situation where people are going to come after your family because of your opinion, then what do you sacrifice? And the answer is, well, you're going to make whatever bad decision you're capable of making at that point, and it's often, well, I'm not going to put my family at risk. Now, that's not optimal. The question then becomes, what's the alternative? And the alternative is, when you're in that situation, well, first of all, to prepare yourself so that if you're ever in that situation, you have some options. Mm. You actually have a chapter about this in your uh, 12 More Rules for Life. Yeah, yeah, in Beyond Order. Yes, yes. Well, I, I dealt with a lot of people who had been bullied into a mental health crisis at work. A lot of people. In fact, part of the reason I made my first public pronouncements, say, on Bill C-16, um, the, the compelled speech law in Canada, was because 20% of my clinical clients were there because they were being bullied by um, narcissists of compassion at work. And they hadn't come to me because of my political stance. This was before anything was known about me at all, politically. That's just, it was a sign of the times, and that was very worrisome. Social workers, um, corporate employees, lawyers, uh, doctors, it was manifesting itself, uh, people in academia, it was manifesting itself across a wide range of disciplines. I even had mothers saying it, which I can't understand mm -hmm. what kind of workplace, that whether it's maybe it's family groups or whatever, yeah. that they couldn't oh, speak. Or mother's groups. Yeah, mother's yeah, groups. Yeah, because they can be viciously, co viciously competitive about who's the most compassionate. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that, that can be very awful. But... Um, do you think there's a good side to the compassionate, uh, so, uh, the social justice movement? Where do they get it right? Do you think that there there is an aspect where we do need to well, love our neighbour? And yeah, someone has to speak for the oppressed. Oh, yeah. So well, that's what's what a healthy way of doing do. that? Well, I think part partly that's that's what you strive to learn your whole life. What a healthy way of doing that is. I mean, the one of the core tenets of Christian theology is that the highest should serve the lowest. It's not, that's not even right. It's not should. It's that what is truly highest manifests itself most precisely in service to the lowest. And that's, that's exemplified, for example, by, by, the, uh, by Christ washing his disciples' feet, for example. Right? So he's, 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 he's taking what's highest and using it to serve what's lowest. And that was particularly relevant in that culture because if I remember correctly, and I think this is still true in some Arab cultures, you don't show people the bottom of your feet, because it's, it's, it's like toilet behavior in some sense, you know, it's, that's in touch, that's part of you that's in touch with what's contaminating, and to serve that is, it's like taking care of the lepers, it's, it's like taking care of the outcasts, and um, it is the obligation, and maybe the privilege of what's sovereign to serve the lowest. In fact, that's, then this is one of the things that's so revol utterly revolutionary about the thought that manifests itself in Christian theology, is that, that what is truly highest is that which serves the most, the most, those in the most dire straits. And that, that's a very remarkable conception of sovereignty. It's certainly not power. It's, it's the antithesis of power in, in the most real sense. And it, it's, it's not obvious either because... It's completely revolutionary. If you look at what came, came, came before, there's nothing... Yeah. Sort of, it turned yeah. what came before completely on yeah. its head. Yes, it's, it's the revolutionary. most radical thinking, and, and, and it hasn't, I don't think, been surpassed since. In, uh, yeah, in well, in some sense it can't be surpassed. Right. And I suppose in, in some sense that's the definition of divine wisdom, right? It's wisdom that cannot be surpassed. Mm. And so... Now, the thing about service to the outcast is that it's not reflexive compassion. Those are not the same thing. Whatever virtue is, is a very complex dynamic balance of many, many sub-virtues, only one of which is compassion. Now, you might say, is there a laneway for untrammeled compassion? And the answer to that is, yes, care of infants. And so, because an infant from birth to six months, say, is always right. Their complaints are always to be regarded as true. 
they're always to be attended to as a first priority. It's actually a precondition for proper development. And I, I was always, I was quite amazed by my wife's maternal capacity. Um, my wife is quite a tough person and she doesn't have a lot of pity, let's say, for useless men. Quite the contrary. Um, but she's unbelievably responsive to infants and so when Michaela was first born I had built this bed. We lived in a small apartment in Montreal and I built this bunk bed out of two by fours. It could have withstood an earthquake this thing, it was very strong. And we, so we built a platform bed in this small room we had and we built Michaela crib underneath. And uh, so we'd sleep above her and uh, at night if Michaela would just stir and make a noise, maybe indicative of discomfort or hunger, Tammy would be instantly up down the stairs and attending to that baby even before she woke up. It was quite remarkable. It wasn't something that I was wired to do, that's for sure. And she would generally have Michaela soothed, fed or or dealt or the, or the source of discomfort removed. Maybe she was too hot or too cold or something was, you know, bothering her that she couldn't move away from. She'd fix that so quickly that the baby wouldn't even wake up. And so it was perfect responsiveness. But, um, but, you know, Tammy was also wise enough so that as her children matured, she could step away from that all-encompassing maternality that's properly directed towards infants and start to be more judicious, more judgmental, which is what you have to become as your children mature because you, you have to set a standard for their behavior that expands as they mature. And so that brings judgment into mercy, right? And judgment and mercy are the twin hands of God in some sense. And to say that God's hand is only mercy, well that, if it's only mercy, well then it's the devouring mother. That's Mary gone seriously wrong. And then a judgment coming back, uh, sorry, revelation at the end of the Bible is almost like a little bit of judgment interjected yes, into the New yes, Testament, yes. having well, had a lot Jung's, of it in the that Old That was Jung's comment on the psychological um, re re reason, in the broadest sense, why revelation was accepted as canonical. It's because he, he believed that the image of Christ that was put forth in the Gospels tilted hard towards the merciful. Now, it's not only mercy, because Christ flips the money changers tables, for example, and goes after the Pharisees and the scribes pretty hard. But in Revelation, the judgmental aspect of the Logos is much more, it's much more front and center. And it's, it's quite a damning vision in some sense, unless you happen to be among the elect, let's say. And, and well, you, you know, uh, time will tell, so to speak, whether that's true. Uh, so. A, but that compa you said, you know, is there a place for compassion? Yeah. It's like, yes, yes there is, but everything in its proper place. And it's a very complex problem. I mean, one of the issues that Jung returned to repeatedly, um, and you see this in the Harry Potter stories too. So there's a Trinitarian structure in Christianity, but for Jung that meant there was a missing quadrant, because he believed that general revelatory visions of totality, like the vision of paradise, which is a circle, divided into four parts, two rivers coming from a central point. Paradise is a mandala divided into four parts. That's north, east, west and south, that's the whole world. There's a missing quadrant in Christianity um, and it's filled either by Mary or Satan and they argue for priority in some sense as a, to provide a fully fledged out vision of, of the transcendent. And you see that in the Harry Potter stories with the houses because the fourth house is Slytherin. And the, 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 the champion of Slytherin in some sense is Snape and Snape has his role but there's also ambivalence there with Hermione like what's her position exactly because in some sense she's the wisest of the, of the heroes right? but she's feminine and so she's, she's, she fleshes out the story as does Slytherin and Snape but there's, it's a very difficult combination, it's even the serpent, it's a very difficult combination to integrate into the into the complete vision. And so, and, and Rowling did a very good job of that. I mean, her books are remarkable. She has an unbelievably accurate visionary imagination. She, stu she managed narratives in that book that are almost unbelievably deep. The, the, uh, the game, the uh, Quidditch game, 
narrative is unbelievably deep. I can't figure out how she figured that out. But I think she has an unerring visionary imagination, like, like William Blake. You know, she's a real visionary. And, you know, you might say, well, it's just entertainment. It's like, look, man, this woman came from nowhere, and she's richer than the Queen. She's like a ma major British export all by herself. Um, she, she enticed tens of millions of children to read 700-page books, many of them. She spoke to stadiums full of children and their families. She spawned an entire entertainment industry, which then turned on her on the movie front, which was utterly appalling and unforgivable and so narcissistic and so ungrateful. Yeah. And, uh, and, but her imagination is, is unerring. Like the, the Quidditch game, it has two tiers, eh? So the ordinary Quidditch, I'll probably get some of the details wrong, is, is kind of like basketball or soccer played on brooms. It's, it's just a game. Every, everyone can understand it. But on top of the game, there's a meta game, and that's the game the Seekers play. And the Seekers follow this golden ball that shimmers and moves. And that's an alchemical symbol, that round ball. It's the round chaos. And it's the container of possibility. Mm -hmm. And it's associated with the, the symbol of Mercury. And Mercury is the winged messenger of the gods. And Mercury is mercurial. And Mercury gathers gold. And Mercury, literally, the metal Mercury gathers gold. If you mix Mercury with gold ore, it takes the gold to it. And so, it's very complicated, symbolic domain of representation. And Rowling's intuition was that the seeker wins, the seeker by seeking and, and following what glimmers and, and dances, and that's the artistic inclination to follow what glimmers and dances, is the successful seeker wins all the games. And she put that all in that, she just packed all of that into this little side narrative of, of Quidditch. It's stunning. And, and, and to use that image, that winged ball, that's a really old image. And it's really obscure. And what it means is not obvious. And she got it right. She got it dead on. It's really something. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of miracle of, of intuition. Have you had interactions with her? No, no. We've, we've, we've made, I've made some attempts to reach out to her. She's responded. Um, peripherally we haven't met and I don't know the reasons but one of the reasons is she's well has things to do but she's also busy writing yeah. and so but I would like to talk to her because I, I would like to find out how she felt her way forward well making these stories because she has an unerring vision and so that's that's very interesting uh, and it's a culturally significant phenomenon I mean she filled a massive theological void and uh, very effectively, and 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 the books are delightful. And, and the newest deep. book is is actually pertains to this conversation we've had because it's about being mobbed by uh, trans activists. Mm -hmm. So she's turned it, and this is actually a wonderful thing: is she's turned that experience into something beautiful. Into well, I haven't read it, so mm -hmm. but I'm assuming it's beautiful, mm -hmm. and and turning it into art, which is mm -hmm. which is very encouraging. It's it's leading Great. by example. I oh, she does. Amazing. She's she's obviously uh, she's she's got a spine of steel. That woman. Now you could say, well, you know, she has the money to allow herself to do that. It's like, do not confuse security with courage. Those are not the same thing. And I've watched people for years in privileged and secure positions, professors, let's say, who are as secure as anybody can possibly be made in this world, and the notion that as soon as you're secure enough, you become courageous. It's like. <laughs> No, that, that's no. It's you've got more exactly to lose. Exactly backwards. You've got more yeah, to well, lose. So well, you've so, also sacrificed. You may have sacrificed your integrity already, in many many ways, to attain that position of security. It's, it's not like you were sense. practicing being brave. So yeah, yeah, and security doesn't make people brave. That obviously, yeah. because if you're if you're speaking, only in a from a position of security, there's nothing brave about that. I mean, it might be brave if someone else did it, but if you bear no risk, then that's not brave. And, and I, I haven't seen at all that people who are more well protected from the vicissitudes of existence are braver in consequence. I, I don't see any evidence for that. 
The, 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 in, in defense of that, though, I, I, in my experience, is that I, I did feel, well, I can afford to go through this. And I felt for a lot of people who couldn't afford, who couldn't afford to, you know, they have mortgages to pay or, or rent to pay. So yeah, in that sense, I'm, I'm it, it, it would have been more brave for someone with that sort of pressure than me. I'm not, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced because you had different things to lose and you had different sources of stability. And one of your sources of stability was financial and you did have that on your side but when people are put into a corner and push comes to shove they have their advantages and they have the cost that they have to pay and it isn't obvious to me that that's that different between people now i do understand that some people are in unbelievably straitened circumstances and you might say well they can't afford to be virtuous but my observation has been that I have met people in unbelievably straitened circumstances who had nothing going for them in a way that you could po hardly possibly imagine, who were nonetheless brave and virtuous. And, and I've met some very damaged people. God, people who were basically, they're outcasts in every way, street, living on the street, with a serious mental illness, with a pathological family, alcoholic and psychotic, um, with an, with, who were ill, who were intellectually impaired, who were physically unattractive, who were uneducated, all at once, who were virtuous and brave. And so there, there's an independence of position. There's an independence of position from moral virtue in a, in a very, very, very fundamental sense. I met other people too who were brutalized so badly as children that you can't listen to their stories without weeping, who decided that they would nonetheless put them, their lives together and move forward. And so I think that's that's the choice everybody makes. And in some sense, that's an equal choice. You know, now I understand, you know, you had the financial resources when this all happened. So that one thing you weren't going to lose was your financial security, mm -hmm. maybe. Right. But, and that is definitely something you had in your corner. But people have various things in their corner, uh, including the integrity of their soul. And I've seen people, as I said, I struck, I struck dumb with admiration for some of my most alienated and struggling clients who would still, it's heartbreaking, were still even in their absolute catastrophe of their existence, be motivated to find someone who yet had it worse and help them. Unbelievable. And that, that speaks to this, the central equivalence of value of human beings in some fundamental sense and and also the similarity of their moral obligations it's really something it's it really changed me watching that in my most in the clients i had who had the most difficult lives and i had a very wide range of clients ranging from people who were hyper successful you know in multiple dimensions to people who were so demolished that it was a constant miracle of revelation, how much trouble surrounded them and, and that they were in. And still, many of the people who were in privileged positions made elementary errors that really hurt them. And many of the people who were barely hanging on to the ragged edge of disaster made the right decisions. So it's something to see, man. Given this climate that we've described a little bit, I wondered if there's a Jordan Peterson prediction. So if Dostoevsky said uh, socialism would kill 100 million, if yeah. Nietzsche said that we've killed God and there won't be enough water to uh, mop up the blood, what's your prediction for the future? What do you see? Well, uh, I've thought this for quite a long time, but, but it's more obvious now. Um, we'll either subject ourselves to an internal or an external approximation of the apocalypse. 
And so we can either get our act together, which means to voluntarily subject ourselves to the flaming sword as an individuals, or that will be impressed upon us as a necessity from without. And how intense that will get, we're, we're going to find out because it's coming very fast and this is going to be a rough winter. And we've done everything we could to make it rough because this is, whatever happens this winter is pretty much 100% self-inflicted. Yeah. So your hair is a political reference you're, you're, you're making then. Well, about the energy, energy, energy crisis, crisis, and, crisis and inflation and, yeah. and it. Yeah. Well, specifically, specifically the energy issue because it was absolutely obvious that what's, going to, what's happening right now was going to happen. It was, if you had your eyes open vaguely for the last 10 years, mm -hmm. you thought, oh, I see where that's headed. And now we're there. And why? Because we went there. Mm -hmm. So, and we, we did that as moral posturers. Do you, do you, do you see any, any hope then? Of, or do you see any, anyone with the leadership to to navigate us through that sort well, of Well, we'll see. You know, I've met lots of great people who, who have tr true leadership ability. A lot of that true leadership ability uh, is what true leaders do, just so everyone knows, um, is they go out and listen to people. Like, really listen. What's your problem? What's your problem? What's your problem? And then they aggregate all the problems. Then at least they know what the problems are. And then they... They listen. What do you want? What would you, what would you like to see as an alternative? They aggregate all that. And then that's a bottom-up movement in some real sense. Like, well, here's the problems, is what everyone's saying. Here's the commonalities across what they're saying. Here's what people would want. Well, then the leaders figure out how to make that happen. And then people are happy because it matches their needs. Now, that can become corrupt because if you're having problems, you can look for someone to blame and... That's, that's the process that the left-wingers accuse the right-wingers of uh, manifesting in the form of populism, right? And I think that was one of Trump's temptations, was to listen to the problems, manifest themselves as resentment, and then offer a solution based on resentment. And the left-wingers do that too, obviously, and perhaps even more egregiously. But that's not a good solution. Um, a solution is a better vision. And do we have leaders that can provide that? We're struggling for a better vision. And I would say a lot of the activism on the left, to give the devil its due, is also the struggling for a better vision. The notion that we should be stewards of the environment, which is a much better way of conceptualizing it, uh, caretakers, Conservers. Yeah. Conservers, yeah, yeah. You'd yeah, think the conservatives yeah, would yeah. embrace it more. Right, anyway. right, right. Well, and tenders of the garden, right? Keepers of the garden. Uh, that's our divine uh, obligation, let's say. That there's something in that, that. That's part of what drives the environmentalist ethos on the positive front. Um, the negative front is something like, you know, human beings are a cancer on the planet and we're the despoilers of nature. and we're viewed as antithetical to the natural order instead of an emergent part of the natural order. And uh, we're, we're obliged to shoulder a, like an anti-nihilist burden of guilt for violating the natural order. And like you can see an impulse in that to, to tending, but, but you can also see it's war it, it being warped in a terrible way by, by, guilt and shame and accusation and and envy and the desire for revenge on god for creating such an appalling place let's say and that's what it is most fundamentally and that's the spirit of cain and so hmm. on a on a more positive note you had a very wonderful video uh, because this week here in London we are mourning the death of our monarch, the Queen, and your monarch as well as a Canadian. And there's a wonderful video um, where you really praise the institution and, and its significance, which I urge listeners to, to find for themselves. But I wondered whether 
as a Canadian and as she was your head of state as well, whether you had a personal uh, uh, fondness for her uh, as, a, as a woman, as, a, as, as your queen. There's certainly admiration for her and fondness, likely, to the degree that you can be fond of someone who exists in some sense as an abstraction. Um, it, I think you have to be a fool not to admire Queen Elizabeth. You have to be an envious fool. You have to be unable or unwilling to put yourself in her shoes. Um, people, are, many, are bitterly carping about her privilege. It's like she lived in a she lived in a in a zoo. She lived in a magnifying chamber. Um, I went and met a soccer player, a football player this week, Ronaldo. Christian. Very glad you brought that up because, as a Manchester United fan, that was uh, the, yeah, was the thing I wanted to ask him. But we know we talked a bit about his life, and he really, in some sense, can't go out because he's so famous. And so, nothing in his life is, he doesn't have the advantages of someone who's ordinary, let's say. You think, well, there's no advantages to being ordinary. It's like, yeah, there is. You can walk down to your local pharmacy. That's a big advantage. And Ronaldo doesn't have that. And you say, well, he's got his fortune. And he does, and, and he deserves it, as far as I'm concerned. And, but he lives a circumscribed life. Mm -hmm. And his life is nowhere near as circumscribed as the Queen's life was. I mean, she was on display. She had to be on her best behavior every single place she went from the time she was in her early 20s, for 70 years. Always on her best behavior. And you think, well, you think you could have managed that? In your situation, where hardly anyone's looking at you at all, you're on your best behavior all the time, are you? I don't think so. You think you could have done what she did? And then you accuse her of, like, this unearned privilege? It's like, her life was one Look, I'm sure she had a wonderful adventure, you know, and more power to her for that. But her life was one of service, clearly. We don't even know who she was. And that's as it should be. You know, now we know, you know, we can infer she was a conscientious person, she was emotionally stable. She was she had a nice balance of agreeable and disagreeable because she was not a pushover, but she was a caring person. She was reserved. I would say she was somewhat introverted. She wasn't spectacularly creative. And that might be just as well in a monarch, you know, because a monarch is a traditional force. Charles is more creative, I think, than Elizabeth. And that's possibly to his detriment. Now, we'll see, because that could be integrated. But it's complicated when you're a traditional icon to be creative, because those aren't the same thing. Mm -hmm. but, and so you, you can infer Elizabeth's personality. And, uh, but we really don't know who she was, and that's because she kept what was private to herself. And don't complain, that's... don't explain, very much her yeah. mantra. And, yeah. And, in an, and we were talking about this before we started um, recording, but in an age where, where privilege is the cardinal sin, mm -hmm. and, and yet monarchy, I think, uh, has an 80 to 85% approval rating in, mm -hmm. in this country, and that, and you were saying this, is perhaps because of her, the way she sacrificed her life well, to think, serve the well, people. Well, well, exactly. I think, I think that Elizabeth atoned for her privilege. Right? And I think we all have to do that. And I think part of the criticism of privilege that's emerging out of the left, to give the devil its due, his due, once again, is that privilege demands a commensurate responsibility. But that needs to be universalized because as modern people, we're more privileged than any people who have ever lived by a large margin. You know, I think the average family deemed as below the poverty line in the United States has two vehicles. And almost all of them have air conditioning. And a non-substantial minority, a non-trivial minority, have swimming pools. And so poverty in the United States and I'm not saying there aren't poor people in the United States, and I'm not saying there aren't disenfranchised people, but that often has, it's a lot more complicated often than mere lack of money. We have a lot of privilege in the modern world, 
especially in the West. And we need to atone for that. And atone means at one. That's the word, at one. That has to be aimed at something sufficiently high so that the privilege is justified. And what that means in some sense is that as you have more, as, as you've been granted more, because that's your privilege, what you've been granted, you are morally obligated to take on more responsibility. And you might say, well, why should I? And the answer to that is, well, first of all, if you don't, your conscience will torture you. Second, if you don't, and your conscious conscience torments you, and the mob comes for you, you will convict yourself, right, and be unable to mount a defense. Third, or fourth, you'll find that the privilege, if it's not accompanied by a commensurate responsibility, will be hollow and counterproductive. And so you'll be nihilistic and desperate in a sea of plenty. And none of that's a good none of that's good. And so that demand on the left for privilege to be held accountable, there is an element of that that's properly manifest, but a huge amount of it is contaminated with like a presumptuous and narcissistic envy mm -hmm. and an insistence that anyone who has any more than anyone else, which generally means any more than me, has only accrued it through theft. It's like, well, if the person who has more than you only accrued it through theft, and you have more than anyone, like anyone you could speak of, any particular person, so there's some person out there who you have more than. Mm -hmm. Well, did you not steal it too? So how, why can that accusation not be levied against you? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't mean people like me. It's like, yeah, that's convenient for you. I went to this Hollywood <laughs> uh, uh, lecture once. Uh, it was in a very rich Hollywood neighborhood. We were sitting on this lawn that sloped down over the Hollywood Hills looking at the star city in the background, it was really beautiful, and the woman who was lecturing to this crowd of about 200 wealthy people, by, by any standard, was talking about the 1%, and it, it was so comical, and at the end I stood up and said, I, I don't know if you noticed, but you're the 1%, clearly, and if you don't know it, it's like, well, look around. Well, they didn't think so because they thought they were like at the 95th percentile and then there's the 5%. Well, and, and it's, it's not trivial, right? Because maybe you're a millionaire, but you're not a billionaire. And even if you're a billionaire, you're not Elon Musk. Like there are, there are tiers of privilege above you. And so it's really easy for you to think, well, you're the place where victimization starts. Your tier is where victimization starts. Me and everyone lower than me, we're the victims. And everyone above is the thieves. It's like, well, you know, you go two or three layers down and you're indistinguishable from the billionaires to someone who, you know, for whom the ability to buy a glass of Coca-Cola is a sign of almost unimaginable social status. And that's probably the case for maybe two billion people in the world. So we have no idea how much in the West we're all in the 1% and certainly by historical standards. And so we have plenty to atone for. And we're being called upon to do it, right? Shoulder the burden of historical atrocity. Like, well, back to Cristiano Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo, if I may, because I'm, I'm a huge Man United fan. And how did that come about? What, what, what was it like meeting him? What was what's he what's he thinking? What's what's in his mind? Is he a, a fan of yours? Has he read maps of meaning? Well, he had some. He had some. His family went through some difficult times a few months ago, and uh, he, someone forwarded him one of my lectures and he started watching them and, and then he started to read 12 Rules for Life and he said it was very helpful and so he reached out to me, uh, had heard through the grapevine I suppose that I would be in Manchester and so he reached out to me and I thought well that sounds like fun and so I went out to his house and we talked for about two hours about mostly as it turned out we talked about his the details of his current career and spent most of the time strategizing. So that was very fun. And 
you know, he's quite a remarkable person, as far as I could tell. Very youthful looking, which is relevant because he's kept himself in very good shape, which he has to because he's 37 and still playing football at a very high level. So, you know, he's had to attend to himself physically. He's very disciplined. Um, I found him very open and gracious. He clearly loves his wife. Um, he's a very, very astute businessman. He's super smart. As far as I could tell, not surprising at all. Apart from you know his God-given natural talent, it's not surprising at all that he's who he is. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those people you meet. You think, yeah, yeah, kind of figures. You're you're who you are, like all the way to the core. And uh, so we had a very productive time together, and uh, time flew. He said, you know, he wasn't sure what we were going to talk about, and I wasn't sure. I mean. I'm a Canadian, and so... Do you know what, what of his, your lectures that he appealed to him? Was it the biblical series? Was it, was it uh, something specific? That I don't know specifically. No, I didn't, I didn't ask him about the specifics. Um, I, think, I think, if I had to guess, it would be the lectures pertaining to the sustaining meaning of responsibility and proper action in the face of tragedy. I, I suspect that that would be the theme that was that was productive, but I don't know specifically. Um, well, uh, I would have loved to have been a, a fly on the wall, uh, but uh, uh, well, I'd like to ask you, uh, well, I've got a few more questions, but I'll ask you one more question. Um, you're, uh, you're writing a book, We Who Wrestle With God, and um, I guess this ties back to my earlier question, I mean, the note you wrote in Maps of Meaning to your father, saying you, you, you're struggling to articulate these ideas, and in the 23 years, that have have gone since maps of meaning do you feel like you're closer to articulating yes. those ideas and is this well i'm practicing that all the time you know each of the lectures is an opportunity to push that capacity to articulate a little further to make it a little more differentiated to make it a little more accessible to make make it clearer and so and it's an unfolding right because the ideas well first of all they're not my ideas but the ideas were implicit, and then they unfold. Right? Maybe they unfold first of all in revelation, and then they unfold in art, and then they unfold in narrative, and then they unfold in philosophy, and then they unfold in apprehensible public speech. It's something like that, and it's a constant unfolding. And so, you know, I'm for me, I'm on the edge of my ability to do that unfolding, and that's the edge that I occupy. And I think the reason that my lectures are successful, my lectures, they're not really lectures, they're conversations with the crowd in some real sense, but the reason they're successful is because it, they offer people an opportunity to participate in the process of that unfolding, because it's not, it's not only unfolding for me in some sense, it's unfolding for those to, with whom I'm communicating at the same time. And the lectures, the public events, are a place for that to happen. You know, you know, it's the same thing in some real sense that you're doing when you're playing your music. You know, you're, you're having you know, an idea is unfolding. You, have, you feel the energy and you see mm. what resonates. And, and you, right, you, you see what resonates. It's, it's a conversation. Right, 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 right. And you know, when, when a concert goes great, the audience is the same place you are. And everyone is doing the same thing. It's a form of collective worship, fundamentally, and celebration. And celebration of what? Well, it's the unfolding of an artistic vision, obviously, because that's what you're doing on stage. And, um, and, and, and there's an improvisational element to that, which is why people like live concerts, mm -hmm. um, and a participatory element. And I would say the same thing applies to my public engagements. And, and it's... It's extremely, it's demanding, but it's extremely um, engaging, mm -hmm. you know, very. So we who wrestle with God then, mm -hmm. will that be a distillation of your public speaking in, in a book? It'll, and and with the advantage to a book is that you can really, it's really rigorous. And so it's, it's a distillation. That, that's, 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 that's a good way of thinking about it. It's a further development of the ideas that I developed in Maps of Meaning and then unfolded in my last two books. And this is, this will be further, way further into the frontier. Like I've made leaps in this book that go, I would say, far beyond 
what I managed in Maps of Meaning. It, there's much more original thought in this book than there is in Twelve Rules or Beyond Order. Because those books were really popularizations in yeah. some sense of the concepts that I had developed in Maps of Meaning. And I was able to make them more apprehensible because I spent 20 years lecturing about Maps of Meaning. And so I learned how to communicate the ideas in a manner that was grippable. And, but with this new book, We Who Wrestle with God, I, 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 I have a, a cardinal idea um, that it's a revolutionary idea. Now it's not my idea in the same sense we've already been talking about. It's the unfolding of something that's been implicit. And, but, but I think I've unfolded it a nice another, another layer. It's very exciting. So I, I can give you like a, an overview in some sense. Well, you act out a story. And not only do you act out a story, but you perceive the world through a story. And so then the question is, well, what story should you act out? And so then you might think of that as what story should you emulate? Or you might think about it as what story should you imitate? Now there's hints of that in doctrines like the imitation of Christ, let's say. But anyways, what should you imitate? Well, you should imitate that which is the highest. Well, is that a description of the objective world? It's like, no, because you can't imitate the objective world. Not obviously. It's complicated, but not obviously. You imitate something like a spirit. Right? You, which is a pattern of behavior. That's a, that's a way of thinking about a spirit. It's a pattern of behavior. So you might say, well, if you're in a concert, the whole audience is animated by a spirit. It's the spirit of music, whatever that spirit is. And, and it inhabits everybody simultaneously. And it's obviously a pattern, because everyone's moving the same way. It's a pattern. Right? And they're synced physiologically, like the band is synced together physiologically. No, and there's something moving about that, literally, because it moves you. Well, there's a pattern that you should emulate. It's a pattern of character. And the stories about God in the biblical corpus are representations of the pattern to emulate. They're not a description of the structure of the objective world. They're not proto-scientific theories. They're an embodied ethos. And it's very complex ethos, because you might say, well, who should you be? Well, you can't sum it up in a sentence, because life is too complicated to sum up in a sentence. Um, you could say, love your neighbor as thyself, if you had to sum it up in a sentence. But still, <laughs> that has to be unpacked. God is presented in the biblical corpus as a character, and as a character that calls to, to emulate. I'll give you a couple of examples. So, for example, in the story of Noah, God is presented as the spirit that calls to the wise in times of trouble to prepare. You might say, well, do you believe in God? It's like, well, do you let that spirit guide you? Well, you do if you're wise and awake. Do you believe? Well, it depends on what you mean by believe. If you follow the spirit that calls you when you're wise to prepare in times of crisis, then you believe. In the most fundamental sense, because you act it out and you see the world. Well, and then God is represented as a character with multiple dimensions. And each story is a representation of a dimension. So another example, in the Abraham story, which is a very fundamental story, uh, God is represented as the spirit that calls the overly dependent and secure to the adventure of their life. So, do you believe in that? It's like, well, do you leave your place of security and have the adventure of your life? Yes or no? No, then you don't believe. Yes, then you follow that spirit. That's the belief, is the following. It's not a propositional statement. It's the following. Then, in the story of Exodus, God is the spirit that calls those who labor under tyranny to shoulder the burden and responsibility of their autonomy. It's like, do you believe in that? Well, figure that out for yourself. It's like, do you think slavery is wrong? Well, of course it's wrong. It's obvious that it's wrong. It's like, yeah, well, there's a reason it's obvious. And it isn't because you figured it out. It, and, it's, and, and it wasn't obvious to many people throughout 
the vastest spans of history. In fact, quite the opposite was obvious. It's like, if I can make you do what I want, why don't I have the right to do that? Or why isn't that even the definition of right? It's like, that's a really hard question. And modern people, and I would say that's particularly true of people on the left, they just recall it. It's, it's obvious that slavery is wrong. It's like, really, it's that obvious, is it? Why did it take us until like 500 years ago to figure that out then? That's so obvious. And, and so, well, so part of this book is an investigation into the character of God, so to speak, and viewed not entirely through the lens of the biblical corpus, but to a large degree. And so, and it's an investigation, the title, We Who Wrestle With God, that's what Israel means, the word Israel means we who wrestle with God, which is really something, because Israel, the people of Israel are God's chosen people. And what that implies at a narrative level is that if you wrestle with God, you're one of the chosen people. And everyone wrestles with God, whether they know it or not. And so, and that's true even more for atheists than for most religious people, because they spend almost all their time wrestling with God. They wouldn't proclaim themselves as atheists otherwise. They'd be off, you know, chasing girls or something, which probably is what they should be doing. <laughs> At the end of Demons, Dostoevsky talks about it's better to be off the fence, not believing yeah. in God, than on the fence, you know, as an uh, agnostic. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and, well, that, and you see that in the book of Revelation, too, because Christ says very straightforwardly, in uh, the vision of Christ uh, is accompanied by the sentiment the, that those who sit on the fence are those who will be subject to the harshest judgment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, because you want to play both ends against the middle, eh? And, that's just, you never commit then, and then you never learn, mm. and then you're done. So at least if you're an atheist, it's like you're going hard at the problem. You know, that's why I admire people like Dawkins and, and Harris. Well, I was going to ask this actually, and this question that I meant to ask earlier, because you've criticized the, the postmodernists often, mm -hmm. but I wondered about the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the mm -hmm. new atheists. Yeah, well, Douglas Murray was sort of in that camp. Sure, he was, yeah, and uh, uh, he was Hitchens' uh, uh, protege, in, in, in a sense, and, and yeah, Hitchens, Harris, Dennett, and, and Dawkins. Mm -hmm. that in a way, there you might one might if you might like to describe them as as people doing, as Nietzsche said, killing God. You know, just mm -hmm. trying to get rid of him. And I, I wondered if you thought that they had uh, had any uh, blood in their hands, like the postmodernists, or, or rather, mm -hmm. what damage do you think they've wreaked or have worked on 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 the institutions we've discussed? And well, you know, I I. I like Sam Harris, and we've got along real well, and I think Sam's a good guy, fundamentally. I think he's trying really hard to be a good guy. Um, I think that he's obsessed with the problem of transcendent evil, and that's like three quarters of the way to a religious revelation in some fundamental sense. He, he's also spent a lot of time in recent years on his meditation app, and he's taken a side journey into Eastern mysticism, and there are reasons for that. Um, I don't think Sam wants to develop a religious belief that his critical intellect could demolish. And so as long as he leaves the transcendent ineffable, he can have a relationship with it. And so I can understand that. And, uh, and Dawkins, I learned lots from Dawkins. I, I liked his biological work. I mean, it's very reductionistic, but hey man, if you can reduce something complex to something simple, and you can do it, more power to you. And what are the limits of that? Like, I, I think that Dawkins, I don't think Dawkins, look, Dawkins is very smart, so you have to criticize someone like that very carefully. I don't, he told me that I was drunk on symbols, and I would say, well, he's parched. Drunk on symbols. Drunk on symbols. Yeah. But, but. And he's parched on. And he's parched without them, you know, but, but it's also a temperamental difference, you know, a lot of, Scientists bounce off Jung because they they're not visionary in their imagination and many scientists aren't because science is actually an algorithmic process and Dawkins is a very good scientist but he's not a visionary um, even I shouldn't even say that quite because his concept of memes is so close to the concept of archetype that you just have to tap it and would fall into that category archetype the Jungian idea of archetype is like a meta meme it's way deeper than the idea of meme, because a meme, like an archetypal meme, is a spirit. 
It has its own life. It extends over centuries. It's capable of possessing people. It's deep. It's biologically grounded. The meme is way deeper than, than Dawkins realized and his followers. And if you push the meme idea farther, you get to the archetype. Well, then you're in trouble because then you get to the religious and quickly. And so, you know, one of the things maybe, maybe that Dawkins didn't realize is that some memes are true. Right, and a true meme is religious. And I mean by definition. So, or at least that's one way of looking at it. And so, and, and Dawkins... Does that just mean that a meme is an archetype? Is that in, what you mean? A deep meme is an archetype. They're the same thing. It's the same idea. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem that Dawkins would run into is that, well, and, and Harris too, is, well, are there valid archetypes? And I would say, well, you guys, you're hoist on your own petard at that point because valid memes are biologically instantiated and you're biologists. And so, like the biologists who I read, who were the deepest on the philosophical front, were biologists of emotion and motivation. Because they saw in the intrinsic structure of motivation and emotion, which is biologically grounded, the emerging point for narrative. And they're right. And Harris and Dawkins are rationalists. And so, the domain of emotion and motivation, in some sense, for them is contaminated, I would say, with the religious, which they identify with the totalitarian impulse, and, and over-identify with the totalitarian impulse. But there's some real sorting out that has to be done there, because Dawkins also knows that behavior is deeply biologically patterned. It's like, what the representation of a deep biological pattern in narrative is a meme, but it's true meme, and a true meme is religious. And so, what do you do with that? Well, that partly, I've tried to talk to Harris with some real success, I would say, and to Dawkins with some success, although not as much as I would have liked, and that's partly my fault. Um, but I also think, I also think, I also think that both Dawkins and Harris know that something's up. Uh, and I think with Dawkins, that's probably because the humanists who are his children, so to speak, haven't exactly turned out the way that he had hoped. And with Harris, I think it's more the dawning realization of the necessity of the transcendent. Now, like I said, he shies away from any concretization of that. That's why he's a Buddhist, so to speak, you know, because then you have God and all his ineffability. You can't criticize him if you can't conceptualize him. But the problem with that is you can't bring him down to earth either. And Jonathan Pajot has made some trenchant criticisms of Harris's thinking in that regard. It's like, well, how do you bridge the gap between the transcendent and the particularized without, without, a, without a theology? Because the theology is the bridge. Harris basically thinks, well, you can have the ineffable and you can have the, the rabble with no intermediary structures. It's, it's a Protestant idea also in some sense, although the Protestants had the book, mm. right? Whereas for Harris, it's more like unmediated contact with the divine. It's like, first of all, you really think you're ready for that, do you? Because if the divine is <laughs> the chimeras wielding flaming swords that turn every which way, then you better look out if you have any unmediated contact, because you might find out that like so much of you has to go that you can't even live. Highly probable. It's notable how, how much more respectful you are of them than the postmodernists in that sense. And, and the, the, there's actually a sort of sense of admiration in, in the, the way you speak about that. Yeah, well, scientists, man, they're, you know, Harris is a scientist and Dawkins might be a great scientist. Um, the postmodernists, the fact that they leapt so conveniently into the hands of their a priori Marxism, that, that tempers my admiration greatly. I mean, I've learned a lot from Foucault and some from Derrida, uh, almost nothing from Lacan. I can't read Lacan, and I don't think that's me, but it, maybe it is, but I don't think so. Um, but there's lots, uh, there's lots of meat to chew on in Foucault. But, uh, you know, and you can, this is the thing about the intellect. You know, it can reach stratospheric heights and go very terribly mm -hmm. wrong, and it can do that simultaneously. And I mean, you see that in Nietzsche to some degree, because I'm a great admirer of Nietzsche. He, I don't know if I've ever read anyone 
who is as glitteringly brilliant as Nietzsche. It's really miraculous. Now Dostoevsky, on the narrative front, is a strong contender and maybe surpasses him in the final analysis. But I don't know if I've ever read anyone who had the stellar capacity of Nietzsche. Um, but he made a mistake. And the mistake was that he believed that human beings could create their own values. And there are even... Which is what Harris is doing a little bit. In some sense, yes, yes. Although Harris, to his credit, he's trying to ground those. The reason he insists that value can be grounded in the scientific is because he wants, he wants a transcendent and objective source for morality. And he's demanding that. Mm -hmm. And the demand is that it be found, found in the scientific realm. And I even have some, what would you call, I have some admiration for that viewpoint because I do see that there is a naturalistic ethos that emerges. So it emerges, for example, in the sense of fair play that even rats possess and that chimpanzees clearly possess. That, that sense of balanced reciprocity as the basis for social organization. Mm -hmm. And so that is a naturalistic ethos. And it is embedded in the logos of the world. And so even on that front, even, Harris has something to say. But there's a big part of the story that is missing there. And, and I, think, I think that argument's actually over. I think Harris and Dawkins and the new atheists lost. Now, that isn't to say that what they did is without value. Because it was trenchant criticism. And you could say the same thing about the postmodernists, except that you know they made this unholy alliance with the Marxists. And great. Well, Dr. Peterson, thank you so much for your time. Um, My pleasure. Uh, I uh, infinitely interesting, and uh, I'm sure uh, people listening will will have thoroughly enjoyed that. And I, I, I wish you a wonderful continued trip here. In, in Britain, and um, uh, yeah, just thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. It was really good to talk to you, and uh, thank you also for your efforts on my behalf. I have some sense of what that cost you, and so, but who knows what the rewards will be, you know, not well, for agitating on my behalf, but for, you know, sticking to your own I've path. got my soul, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, well, fair enough, and it is, and everyone needs to know that, because it is the most important thing. It's the only thing, in some real sense, perhaps.